Bill Bog from BESI. He's going to discuss activities in connection with uh, the ISEX uh, project. Bill? Okay, thank you, Guillermo. Uh, Karen Stone uh, is the lead on this, uh, this effort for georeferencing identification tags. And unfortunately, she got called up to OMSET yesterday and couldn't make it, but she's given me the, uh, all her notes, and I've heard her present about this several times. But uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the, you know, survey. did you want so to be the one? They, Wait, just a second. Go ahead. So, Bill, can I interrupt you there? Do you want me sure. to advance the slide? Is that okay? That's fine. Yeah, go to uh, vision. Uh, what uh, what we were facing was the issue of if there's an you know in, in Bessie we're looking at if you have an oil spill in the Arctic, how do you track that whenever you might not be able to get to that uh, location for some time, or you you might be able to spot it but you can't see it, uh, you can't get there because of bad weather, light conditions, whatever. So the idea was um, to be able to track the location of ice movement or oil on ice, and also just your assets, uh, in even not just the Arctic, but anywhere else, finding a way to track the location of assets so you have a good common operating picture. So. Um, Bessie uh, got with uh, URS Corporation and together with uh, Midstream Technology, the Vigio Systems, and College William and Mary, they come up with this grid tag system uh, that's really a network of tags that can uh, coordinate with, uh, you know, with the ground base uh, through the satellite systems, and uh, they tested it up at ISAC. So uh, next slide, please. Basically, the system is there's a series of small uh, tags, uh, not much bigger than a 3 by 5 card. Uh, and I'm passing around. There's a picture later on. But uh, you have a small, uh, small tag that you can attach uh, maybe to the ice or to a piece of equipment. And you have a whole network of these around. Uh, around a field or location or around all your assets. And then you have one, one or more larger tag that, that is set up to coordinate with a satellite system. So these tags all can communicate uh, with each other. And um, they have, it's kind of a self-healing network. They set it up so that if one of them dies, the battery goes bad or whatever, they can it, it can heal itself, but the the main grid sat uh, tag can coordinate with all the smaller ones, and then occasionally upload it information to to a satellite uh, that then goes to a cloud and through a user interface back to uh, wherever the the stakeholder is or whoever's in, uh, responsible for that for that uh, area. And it can upload information like where's the location, uh, you know, how much battery life is remaining, things like that. And then also it's set up for a two-way so that uh, it can download information to the tags and say things like, okay, go dormant for the next 30 days, 60 days, or something to save battery life. You know, they might not need to know uh, quite as uh, you know, how might not need to know information on a real-time basis so they can delay uh, responses. So anyway, they, it's a system set up to uh, do, do those kind of communications. And it all goes through uh, a gateway to the Internet and through, through servers to uh, back to the users. Okay, next uh, slide, please. And this is uh, what the, uh, the tags look like. The, the one on the left is the uh, is the one that goes is that coordinates with the satellite itself. It goes up to one of the um, uh, iridium satellites. Uh, you know that they have the iridium network up there, so it coordinates through that. And then the smaller one on the right, they they look the same size on this, but uh, 
let's say the smaller one is about three by five and about two inches thick. The other one's about twice the size in, in volume. So, so relatively, relatively small. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is kind of a broken out picture of it, uh, you know, with what's on, what's inside. You got some batteries, the GPS antenna uh, system in there. And um, it's made, if they wanted something that was low cost, could, could uh, work in the marine environment and, uh, you know, have spotty satellite coverage. But, um, you know, also, you know, low energy, uh, low energy usage because they want it to be able to be up there for up to a year. So, you know, you got to have, you know, conserve your battery life over the course of the year. So, sorry, guys, I was going to hand these out to you. But anyway, uh, so they, each unit costs about $75. Uh, and then you have, the, of course, your satellite uh, coverage, coverage link. Next slide, please. You know, whatever that that would cost. Uh, here, uh, here's the vehicle. Uh, they did some, you know, Betsy did some testing here at Sterling and up in Alaska to uh, to see how well they worked and uh, you know find you know be able to see how the system worked and and uh, then they took it up to um, up to ISEX in um, this winter. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, ISEX, if you're, you're probably most of you might be familiar with it, but it's an annual Navy exercise or biennial exercise that they go up and they, they set up an ice camp uh, in the Arctic. Uh, they have a, um, a submarine that comes up and they had some pretty neat footage of it. They have a sat they have uh, some video of a submarine coming up through the ice, just breaking up through. It's very, very impressive. But they come up there and they have, uh, well, as you can see, there's four different nations uh, have flags flying there at the camp, and uh, they do all kind of military uh, exercises, military things. But we were able to send a researcher up there with some of these grid tags and uh, test out how they can be used in the ice or how they can, you know, like anchoring it. Um, let's see, uh, if in the upper right, you can see he's deploying one of the tags. Uh, they're, they're enclosed within these, these green, uh, green and orange uh, uh, units. And so what they're doing is they have, uh, one of them has screws on the bottom, other ones have spikes. But what they did was develop it so they could drop it from three to 500 feet, have it land on the ice, and then stick in position, okay? And they, they were successful in it. They, they're trying some different ways of doing it uh, and see how they can, you know, better ways of, of attack, uh, attaching it. And one of the problems um, they had was apparently polar bears like them. <laughs> polar bears <either. laughs> so <laughs> polar bears, I guess, were intrigued by them, so uh, uh, they had some issues there. But uh, so anyway, you can see see what they look like and how they would they could attach to the uh, to the ice. And uh, on the lower left, you can see uh, on the left of that picture is the ice camp. And they had to rapidly evacuate the ice camp because the ice opened up real close to uh, to the site. So uh, they saw that coming. They had to leave real quick. Uh, and Bessie left two of the grid tags in place out there on the ice so they could test it over the course of the year. One of them has gone missing. We think it may have gone down in the uh, in the hole whenever the ice opened up, um, or either a polar bear took it, who knows, you know. But anyway, they can't, uh, we lost track of one of them. So anyway, there's there's a lot more work and uh, development going on uh, with these, but, um, you know, they at least got it 
you know, so we have an operational model here and can continue improving it. And now also, it can be used, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, we can, if there's, let's say there's foil under the ice, or some, uh, we can, we're looking at ways where we can identify uh, the oil under there and put in a, um, a tag underneath the ice, like the spherical one at the bottom, or right now I think they use the canoe-shaped one uh, in the test up in ISEX. And they can have the tag on there, have it uh, under the ice, and the units they're using, they're looking at for under ice, will send out what they call LAM waves uh, that uh, propagate along the, uh, the plane of the ice and it can be picked up at another location later on. Mm -hmm. so, so they're looking at ways where they can have one above the ice that can communicate, but then also use, um, use these waves to, to test uh, how well it goes across the, the ice surface and be picked up at other locations. Is that sound? Is that a sound wave? Yeah, it's a sound wave of, of uh -huh. some kind. Yeah, yeah. So it, uh, and, and that, so those sound waves propagate down along the ice and can be picked up at another location. And, and I don't know uh, how far out they tested this time, but they're looking at ways to see how they can extend the range of that. So, mm -hmm. so it'd be very useful for, um, like I said, you know, if there's oil under the ice, you can get it in there, wait till winter's over, go back, find it, because the ice shelf is, their ice, ice has moved miles and miles away, but now because you have the satellite coverage with the uh, grid tags, you can know where that spot has, looked, has moved and then be able to recover when conditions are, are good. And uh, I think it probably has some applications more for you know, in eco, um, uh, ecological studies or whatever where, you know, if you, you want to tag locations that have been not just on ice but anywhere, you know, like with your equipment or something where it is and be able to get it, you know, keep track of it, you know, over time. And that's so. GPS? Yes, it's a GPS, GPS system, yeah. and it, uses the iridium satellites and, you know, they come over every, you know, it's a pretty good network they have up there. So anyway, so that was, uh, that was my update. And, uh, you know, Karen is doing a lot more work on this. They have, uh, actually, she said there's some more uh, work. They're going to continue working on um, deploying Improving the underwater tagging system and, and the spheres for that. So, um, anyway, it's a work in progress, but uh, it's got some promise for tracking and, and common operating pictures for at least the Bessie side here with oil spill response, but possibly for other Arctic applications. Thank you so much, uh, Bill. Uh, are there any questions for him? Um, at, at, at some point when the ice breaks up enough yeah. uh, in, in the late spring, early summer, then you, uh, you're not expecting the oil and the ice to, to be co-located at some point, right? So there's a possibility that at least some of the oil breaks. Sure. Uh, are, you, yeah. are you considering any method to try to track the oil once it's free in the water? Well, at some point, at some point yeah, once it's in the water, that's a, that's a different different issue. Yep. Uh, it'd be hard to to have a year, something that floats along with the oil. So you need remote sensing or or some kind of visual observation. Please. Well, well, a, while, a while back we thought we had drifters that did that. Yeah. To some extent. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's not part of this the study. Okay. But uh, yeah. but if they're you know if somebody has those systems, it's possible that they could be. It has to be mounted on somewhere, you know. It has to be mounted. You know. mm -hmm. Yeah, it they be free floating. Right in the in those picture, you know, you saw the round units. Mm -hmm. They would have those. They would be housed. That would be housed in there, uh, inside of that. 
and and then it, when it is placed on the ice, or you know, it it comes down and it locks into place by. It, they're looking at different ways of doing that. Maybe like with a basically a water balloon, it comes down, and because it's so cold, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, the the freezing of it locks it into place. You know, so there's different ways, but. Uh, the tags you're looking at, they have where you can screw it into, let's say, your booms, your skimmers, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, vessels, snowmobiles, uh, actual vessels, whatever. Yeah, vessels, anything. Yeah. Are there uh, other questions for Bill? Yeah, it's Martin, Martin Jeffries, OSTP. Um, Bill, thank you. This is fascinating uh, what you've developed here. Um, one or two questions I have is, um, if I understand correctly, at the moment these uh, tags are just GPS trackers, um, but could they be upgraded to include a temperature sensor, say, and a barometer? Then they become little weather stations. And if you did that, then um, it would be very good if they were programmed to send their data into the WMO GTS so that the data were broadly available, and even getting into National Meteorological Services um, forecasting models uh, and so on. Uh, and then a final um, data um, point is if, if it becomes routine deploying these um, to also get the data into the archives of the International Arctic Boy Program, which is based at the University of Washington Applied Physics Lab. Okay, uh, I don't know the answer about uh, you know like temperature sensors or barometers. I think right now, uh, and these units are pretty small, but there's no. I personally, I don't see a reason why you couldn't uh, deploy them attached to. Uh, to a, a barometer or temperature sensors that you want. I'll, I'll pass it on to Karen that that's uh, um, something to think about in the future uh, to do more than, you know, more than just uh, tracking at the moment because that, that sounds like a very useful upgrade that um, could have much broader application. Yeah. Uh, could I also <laughs> ask, um, and this is, I have to ask, forgive me, what's the price of these units? Uh, yeah, it was. Um, they said it was about seventy-five dollars for each of the tags, uh, and then whatever the satellite uh, um, satellite charges are that you um, you set up. And the two sizes. I mean, the master and the slave. Different. They're all the same. Uh, that I don't know, Walter, but yeah. the small is about seventy-five. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure the other one's probably a little bit more. Yeah, because it has to it has to communicate upward and then be able to collect information from the others. But but that's roughly the uh, you know the ballpark. That's a satellite modem. Do you, um, do you know how what the range from the slave unit to the sort of green set is? Uh, you want to ask that, Walter? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how, how big that was, uh, and I've heard, and I can't remember, and I don't want to give out information that's not okay. not accurate on it, sure. but I'll, I'll try to find out. Can you pass it to Jeff? Okay. We, we can provide an update on the website also uh, yeah. later. And, and, yes. This is Sarah, um, and thanks for that presentation. It was really interesting. I do think that a lot of it does relate to this milestone that we have, uh, 3.1.2G, I believe. And um, if Bill or Karen or Guillermo could update that milestone, I think it would really help and um, get it recorded and um, provide the information to a broader community. So if somebody could take care of that, that would be wonderful. I, I... I do agree, Sarah. I was planning to mention that after questions, but yes, this is um, our last agenda item for today. So we we can um, wrap it up uh, at that point. Uh, but yes, I totally agree with with that um, action. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
Uh, Jim. Question. Hi, uh, Jim Price here. Um, uh, is, the, is the choice to go with a master slave system because you want to limit the cost of transmitting to the Iridium satellite? So you're cutting the number of transmitters I, down? I don't know yeah. if that's the, that was the basis uh, for that decision, okay. but, but there's a lot of other systems where you try to, you have a network around and, yeah. and you know, rather than, yeah, like you say, you, you could have all of them communicating, but then it's a lot more expensive. But this okay. way you can, you can set up a network and, you know, frame an area or whatever with uh, with the uh, the slave units rather than, you know, one master or, or multiple ones too, you know, but it's, yeah. And it, and it, yeah, and it, it sets up a whole, you know, having a network, you know, one goes down, the network self heals and you know works so. up, but they're they're continuing to work on it and and you know as far as distance limits, I'll try to find out where they're at now. But I, you know, they're working on ways that they can improve the efficiency and and that. So you know, it's just as they develop the technology more and more, it'll you know it'll improve. Thank you, Bill. 